<laughs> Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 464. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And today's December 14th, 2018. Okay, welcome to a new show. Well, it's not new. We've been doing it for 464 episodes, but it's new for today. It's Friday. Um, before we get going, we need to have our audience participation time. If you like the episode, please click the like button, either on Facebook or on YouTube. Um, if you really like us, or if you don't like us, share us with your friends. The best way to get this uh, show out to all the Anglicans out there is word of mouth because we have no advertising budget whatsoever. Um, comments. People have been commenting more and more. Some of those have been very personal and I appreciate... No, I don't. <clears throat> be, be gentle with me. Uh, but please comment either on YouTube or Facebook. They're fun to read. Um, if you've not subscribed yet, go to the YouTube channel. Click the red subscribe button. If you want to get instant notification that a new show is out, click that little bell next to it and it will send you a notification every time we post a show. We have a podcast. Pretty cool, huh? I'm going to show you how easy it is to get the podcast. You can go to the show notes or you can do Alexa, play the latest Anglican Unscripted podcast. Getting the latest episode of Anglican Unscripted. Here it is for my heart radio. Isn't that cool? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is the coolest my. thing ever. So uh, you can just ask Alexa to or download it and she'll play it. Thing ever. I'm not sure. <laughs> it's creepy. It's so creepy. Actually, people who are not listening to the headphones right now and have Alexa are now listening to a, a, a backup echo of unscripted behind them. Oh, stop. Alexa, stop, stop, stop. So, yeah, we can be played on Alexa. We can be played in your car. We can be played on your iPhone or anything that is podcast. So we're, we're happy about that. Uh, George, let's move a little bit on to the news. Um, I need to read this because it was really weird when uh, you sent me the link. But I did not know we have... Oops, I got to go way over here. We have an official hater within the uh, the Episcopal Church. This and is so exciting, Kevin. <laughs> this I is am exciting. so happy and pleased. <laughs> one of our friends, one of our... One of us... Is now an official hater. Well, the, oh, I mean, the cool, th th the cool thing is, um, a badge of honor in the ACNA was to have a deposition letter from uh, Presiding Bishop Catherine Shore. You know, uh, it basically, oh. it was your, it was a ticket to your new job. And, that, uh, yeah, 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 I agree with that. But this is so much. This is bigger. Than, this is bigger. This is, this is the big time. This is the big leagues. This is okay. Yankee Stadium for the World Series <laughs> night game. It is. Seven so games. let's tell people who Southern Poverty Law Center is. The Southern Poverty Law Center is a, a group of individuals who um, raise money. Uh, they are not for profit, so they can find haters. And they identify haters as basically anybody on the right, anybody who's conservative, anybody who has any opinion uh, that is not theirs on LGTB issues, uh, marriage equality issues, social issues whatsoever. And they have a map on their website uh, identifying where these hate groups are. And uh, they've not identified the ACNA yet, but they found that the Bishop of Albany, Bishop Love, is a hater. And I, the I just, Ku Klux uh, Klan? <laughs> Timothy McVeigh, the American Nazis, and now Bill Love are haters. Oh man, this is so neat. Yeah, he he made the news roundup uh, this week at the uh, Southern Poverty Law Center, and uh, um, just to to codify how well informed they are, they said they're going to use Susan Russell to back up their story. And I said, yes, oh, that's, that's it. That's the unbiased verification. <laughs> oh, my. Well, Kevin, can, tell, tell me a bit about this story so that uh, people well, know. Well, let me just read. Um, they they are just uh, oh, referring to his... Emphasis, okay? Heavy breathing yeah. is important when okay, you read sorry. these SPLC articles. Sure. The Albany Times Union reported November 12th that Albany Episcopal Diocese Bishop Reverend William Love 
issued an edict November 10th that bans same and okay this is coming from the right (laughs) chancellery (laughs) and i like well that's it so they go on they quote his letter and they they quote um susan russell and uh, basically uh his uh christmas letter uh slash um no it wasn't the christmas but his letter talking about uh we're not going to do that here uh has made the southern poverty law center uh, add Bishop Love to the map, and uh, I, I, George, this is the time we just—that's an honor. Uh, one day we hope to be on the list of the Anglican Poverty Law Center. No, we'll never. Uh, be. I mean, the SPLC is basically a, uh, uh, is a is a sham. It's a fraud. It, it the, the the shame of it, I was. A, Social media giants like Facebook and Twitter and Google use the SPLC to de- decide who's a hate group and who's not. So Louis mm-hmm. Farrakhan is not a hate group. Uh, the uh, uh, anti-Semites, uh, the uh, far Antifa, they're not hate groups. But Bill Law is a hate group because he stands for traditional Christian morals and values. <laughs> the man has never heard a fly in his life. He's got the perfect name. Bill Love, this man is a man who would embodies the love of Christ and his ministry and his work. Mm. And this this sham of an organization, these uh, preening, virtue signaling prigs have decided that Bill Love is now a hater. There's yeah, nothing that's... else I think you need to know about what a fraud the SPLC is. Than... No, they're, they're a complete fraud, but you know, I, I just want to let bill feel encouraged this is a sign a good sign this is when people this he 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 has topped he has hit the tops (laughs) okay let's move on to other news that was fun news um we've been watching our presidents on and off and you've heard of something called an executive order and you posted a story this week uh that the episcopal church has decided to um, eliminate the statute of limitations on child abuse um, uh, charges within the Episcopal Church. And it was uh, done by presiding Bishop Curry and uh, pres- uh, the president of the House of Bishops, uh, Gay Jennings. And you post this to me, I'm like, they're suspending a canon by executive order, as far as I can tell. I first, I did not know they had the authority to do this, George. How, tell me a little bit about how the story went, because a general convention said we're gonna look into it. Well, this is, this is what is called magical thinking. The uh, president of the House of Deputies, the presiding bishop of the House of, of the Episcopal Church, who's president of the House of Bishops, Michael Curry Gay Jennings, uh, basically said, here are all the resolutions that came out of the last general convention, and we're going to interpret these to say that we can suspend the canons for, I believe it's a five or six year period, to allow any historical case of child abuse to be brought against the clergy. Now, on one hand, that's an excellent thing. We need to rout out these perverts, these pedophiles, these people who defame and defile the, the Church of Christ. This is well lauded. Nobody can say, hey, you can't do that because you know, it, in principle, you got it. It's something special, but to the end, justify but the means. They, but the thing is, you know, this is the Episcopal equivalent of saying badges. We don't need no stinking badges. We don't need no stinking rules or canons. Hey, we don't like this canon. We'll suspend it for five years and just do what we want to do. Like maybe the Dennis canon. Oh, you know, it, I, I don't think that's next, Kevin. But no, you know, theoretically, they, <laughs> theoretically, an executive order can be issued by the leaders of the Episcopal Church saying we're going to suspend, oh, whatever we're going to want to do. And what's the whole point of general convention? What's the whole point of the canons? Uh, the, the, the rule of law is non-existent in the Episcopal Church anymore. We saw this in the fraudulent trials and uh, sham prosecution. I mean, the not the Soviet show trials of people like Bob Duncan and and Keith Ackerman and Mark Lawrence, where the uh, d- where the sentence is carried out first, and then they come with the rule and the conviction afterwards. He and this is just another step down that road. We have canons, we have rules, and at this last general convention, we had a resolutions saying we we uh, must have uh, gay marriages everywhere, and now resolutions which don't cha- affect the canons, 
unless they're specifically designed to do so, now take precedence over canons, over diocesan canons. Now we have executive orders that take precedence over canons in the Constitution. This is dictatorship. I, this well, is authoritarianism. Dictatorship, but I have to wonder if maybe, perhaps, um, they know some people who are about to time out. And they, they said, we got to do something because uh, we know them. This is getting lawsuits are about to break and we need to we need to be upfront about it. Now, Kevin, I he, this is why it's a conflicted issue, because their motives are, are good. We mm -hmm. uh, I had a pastoral visit yesterday where I live in Florida. Nobody is from this part of the world except for crocodiles and alligators. And we had some. I maybe have a dozen or so people who joined the church in the last year who are still Roman Catholics, and they come here because their church is up north. They are so upset with the Catholic Church over clergy, how the church has handled clergy sexual abuse. I had a woman in my office yesterday. Uh, she's been coming here uh, seasonally for three years. She'd like to join our church. Can she still be a Roman Catholic and be an Episcopalian? And I said, well, if you turn in a pledge card, you can be whatever you want. Uh, but I said, well, why do you want to be an Episcopalian? And because she's angry at the Roman Catholic Church. And I politely said, that's not good enough reason. That's not... We'll still take your money. But, <laughs> you know, we are a little different in some places. This is my wife, Susan, not my housekeeper. You know, there's certain subtle differences. <laughs> but in other words, the, the mishandling of the clergy sexual abuse cases... Uh, do you remember Catherine Jefford Shorey when she was Bishop of Nevada? She took a defrocked Roman Catholic priest, a child abuser who had abused teenage boys, and she made him a priest to the Diocese of Nevada without any investigation of his background because he was a gay activist. Mm -hmm. Now, that is actionable conduct. Do you think the statute of limitations is going to be waived for Catherine Jefford Shorey's malfeasance? No, yes, I, I think <laughs> No, I don't think so. I think she's protected. Uh, <laughs> but at the same, so, I mean, we, we can't throw stones at any other denomination. But by the same token, if they're going to do these things, they should do it right and in good order. Because once you begin this, once you start down this road of the, author, of the, the, uh, the, the chief in charge, by his whim, can suspend the rule of law and do what he likes, Next, we'll start bombing aspirin factories in Sudan or something. Um, well, it, it's interesting. He, he didn't do it alone. He got uh, a wink week agreement with uh, uh, the pres President Jennings. And I wonder if that's his executive order there. I don't know, Kevin. And maybe there are some s double secret super probation rules that I'm just not aware of. No, I no, but the um, thing I is, would, it's a real I, issue. One of, the, one of Charles Benefin's, Benison's defenses against his trial of covering up abuse was that statute of limitations. Hmm. And, the, uh, and it worked at the time. So they want to undo the Benison defense. Well, there are ways to do that. Reform the Title IX canons to basically say this rather than just say, by executive action, we're doing this. Hmm. That's... that's yeah. That's an abuse of authority, but why well, should we be surprised? On. Yeah, let's move on to our third crazy story today, okay? There's a, ca a Canadian cathedral that has appointed and hired... Oh, friends, a... still pay attention. We said the magic words Canadian church, and usually at this point people click off or zoom out. But this oh, is a good story. This is a good story. <laughs> this, this Breaking news story. from Canada does not mean turn off your TV. Okay, but go ahead, Kevin. I'm sorry. That's all right. Breaking news from Canada. Yeah, I mean, you're right about that. You know, not a lot of news breaks up there. Uh, the Canadian Cathedral hired a spirit guide. And I've been paying attention to uh, tech news, Anglican news for 30 years. And I know that there's been other um, examples of this happening around North America. And I thought I'd bring up your expertise in this. Uh, first, give us a little bit about the story. The Cathedral in Ottawa has hired a, I think they call it First Nations, uh, Native American or Native Canadian, or no, he can't say that either, uh, an indigenous member of, I believe, the Cree tribe to be a, a Native spiritual 
uh, clergymen. So they're basically hiring non-Christian clergy at the cathedral in Ottawa. The, now, the, di the cathedral in Denver hired a Muslim for interfaith purposes. Do you remember the 97 General Convention when the uh, convention commended to us the uh, articles from the uh, Trinity Wall Street magazine yeah. about the raccoon spirit guide and our journey through the underworld led by, a, by the spirits and shamanism? Diocese of Los Angeles always has these Indian shamans when they do these their Episcopal consecrations. Uh, you know, so we can't, as much as I'd like, I can't throw stones at the Canadians for doing something immoral, uh, anti-Christian, <laughs> and contrary to the good news of Jesus Christ of of pandering to the spirit world and to evil. Uh, well, I think it was five or six years ago, maybe a bit longer, but the Bishop of Rhode Island at the time had a person who converted to or had not completely converted to Islam. And uh, this Rhode Island bishop, if I recall, deposed this person. Yes, she was a priest working in, in the Diocese of Olympia, which is Seattle. She was an Episcopal mm -hmm. priest. She was licensed by Rhode Island. And she basically professed Islam. She wanted to be a Muslim Christian priest. And Geraldine Wolfe, the Bishop of Rhode Island, nailed her. Now, the Episcopal Church has acted in the past. Our hero, Charles Bettison, do you, do you remember the Druid priest in Downingtown, Pennsylvania? There was a Oakwise the Druid, who was also an Episcopal priest. And unfortunately, the man had on the posted on the internet pictures of him wearing a long robe with a staff, looked tr dressed like Gandalf. He believed this nonsense. Or, that was Ron Williams. That wasn't... No, no, no. It was Oakwise the Druid. <laughs> and, uh, and, well, the uh, spirit... Uh, how should I put this politely? When the Canadian church, which is falling apart, people don't go anymore. They're running out of money. When they have enough money to hire somebody to preach words that are contrary to the good news of Jesus Christ. At what point do you say, game over, folks? At what point do you say, uh, you're, you can no longer be recognized as a valid uh, ex expression of the good news of Jesus Christ? What gospel are you preaching? Because it's not that of, uh, of our apostles and of Jesus. I live here in the Northeast, and when I drive by closed churches, churches that are for sale, and they're all over the place, the chances that that church has a banner in rainbow colors on it, and it's for sale, is extremely high. I would say at least 70% of the churches, uh, you know, throughout the, the shoreline here, at least going up 95, uh, if they're for sale and they close, their last gasp was to put up a rainbow banner above their church. Uh, and now they're closed. Yeah, just uh, food for thought. Mark, uh, uh, um, I've just lost his last name. Mark Tolley, the, the, the head of the IRD. He's a uh, very uh, prominent... Uh, oh, Kevin, I'm embarrassed. Uh, it's, uh, it's okay. He's been uh, publishing uh, some recent articles on the decline of the main line. Uh, of how, you know, it's not just the Episcopalians that have fallen in half, the Presbyterians, the Lutherans, the United Church of Christ, uh, the Disciples of Christ have lost 80% of their membership since the 1960s. Mm -hmm. And you chart that against the conservative denominations. Now, the Southern Baptists have held their own, but they've seen a little bit of a decline. But the Assemblies of God, the, Disciple, the Christian uh, Missionary Christian Alliance, uh, those that have held fast to traditional Christian teachings are doing very well indeed. And if you look at the Methodist Church, this is one of the things that Mark was pointing out. If you look at the Methodist Church, he's a Methodist, those Methodist churches that are doing very well are those that have been held fast. The ACNA is doing very well. My church, the Diocese of Central Florida, and other Episcopal churches are doing very well. Why? Because we teach and preach the good news of Jesus Christ. We don't follow the fads of the hour. 
There, I've had my rant. Your turn. You know, you did good. I, I hope you watched the show where we talked about transgendered baptisms with uh, Gavin the other day. Yeah, new fad. Um, let's just adopt the the secular society into our church and um, let's uh, worship ourselves. Let's worship yes. the hour. Let's worship the golden calf. Uh, and uh, the pur- the purpose of church is not to worship. Uh, Jesus Christ, but to make ourselves feel good. Uh, Gavin's uh, therapeutic deistic moralism. Um, Indeed. You know, well, you, the, the, problem is, the problem with that is that it's not covered by Blue Cross and Blue Shield. So it doesn't pay to go to a church like that. Now, I, you haven't had time to respond yet to the uh, the three format. Do you think that works for once once a week? Um, I, think, I think the three... It's frustrating for me because I'd like to continue because I think it's it. I enjoy it so much. I don't want to stop. Um, the other thing is that uh, I think we all click uh, from it. Now I'm speaking works. now from a TV perspective. I think the three personalities mm-hmm. click. See, I have the most hair. I am the thinnest. I am the most uh, <laughs> eloquent and attractive. So I mean, I like it. I look good. <laughs> I thought I was the sex symbol. You're the sex symbol. Okay, all right. Changing roles. I'll be the theologian. I'll get a little pipe here. And, and oh, I like being in the middle. I, I really do. The, the only problem is I sometimes feel it's an ABBA video where you have the three of us <laughs> moving across the stage, but we'll, we'll, we uh, won't uh, go into that. Well, I was reading the, the manual for this new software we have. It says we can have up to seven. And I'm like, no way. Can't you just be little strips of people. <laughs> you can see the left eye of everybody as they talk. Uh, the seven, or you could do Brady Bunch, I suppose. We could do uh, six of one out. We'll see. Um, but it's fun to play with. We're still Who playing with the song. Alex B. Davis in the middle. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we're, we're still learning how to uh, interrupt each other and get a point in and do all the types of things we do in this type of thing. We don't want to be CNN where uh, 15 people just talk on top of each other. We just want to be ourselves and work with new software that uh, allows us to give uh, uh, more voices per video uh, than we used to do. I, I do want to do some, I do want to mention one thing. Uh, we've, uh, Anglican Inc, Anglican Unscripted have been doing very well in terms of viewership, uh, readership, comments. But I think sometimes people forget the difference between opinion and news. Kevin, what are you and I doing right now? Analysis. A news analysis, Mm -hmm. which is a form of an opinion piece. There are some stories on Anglican Inc. that are straight news. They are either press releases or they're news articles written from original sources. And then there are opinion pieces. Opinion pieces do not need to be balanced or fair. A news does. And every article is labeled as such. So if you come away annoyed, well, that's not fair. Read, make sure you know what you're reading. Because an opinion piece is an argument where facts are used to advance an agenda. A news piece is where the facts are laid out for you to you to, to figure out your own view on the issue. They're not the same thing. You know, that reminds me, we're launching a new Anglican dot ink website next week but uh, that's that's something we'll, we'll we'll probably announce more on monday as as the time gets closer still working on a, a few uh, operational kinks and that's just part of the new software we have too i'm kevin galson and i'm george conger and you've been watching episode 464 of anglican unscripted